welcome friends. I grew up in hot and sunny Southern California. We did not have air conditioning. We were always comfortable. Our family spent most of our weekends and vacations in the Mojave Desert. My twin brother and I completed graduate school in field biology, where we did research at Joshua Tree National Park on how desert animals are adapted to live in hot environments. Many years later, my wife and I moved to East Texas, where we live next to a bayou. It is a swamp. And every day I saw wildlife dealing with hot and humid conditions. Sweating doesn't work to cool you down when humidity is high. So this is particularly difficult. So what did they do? What lessons can be learned to uh, deal with hot conditions, either in humid environments or in dry environments? I'm going to list seven tips for staying cool and then describe them in detail based on research, they're based on science, they're, they're based on exactly what the animals do and the plants. Tip number one, acclimate to extreme heat. All of our body's physiology, hi B, oh, everybody's joining me. Your body's physiology, several, uh, oh wow, hello. That critter's adapted to the heat. Your body's physiology changes gradually as you adjust to extreme heat. These physiological changes are known as acclimation. And they take place gradually and they're critical for survival. So I'm gonna talk about that and we're gonna learn from sports medicine. The second tip is to use microclimates to stay cool. You know, weather channels on TV and on the internet report conditions in a standard way. That is five feet off the ground and in the open shade. Reality is much different than that. The microclimate down here in the soil where that bumblebee was hiding before buzzing me is much different there than up here. And the color that you are makes your climate much different. So we're gonna talk about using microclimates to stay cool. And every time I do this, I'm absolutely amazed about microclimates. Now the third uh, tip will be to drink plenty of water before you are thirsty. And according to the National Institute of, for Safety and Health, in extreme heat, people should drink eight ounces of water every 15 to 20 minutes. And so continually drinking before you are thirsty. Number four, limit activity during the heat of the day. You know, we should be like the wildlife. They know when it's too hot, even though they're, they're acclimated. Seek shelter when it is too hot. Day active wildlife become much more active when it's really, really hot at dawn and dusk. And some wildlife that are usually day active become night active when it's too hot. And we'll talk more about this. And I'm going to share some links to some things that I, I published a few years ago on, on the internet. I, I talked about a few years ago how to do night hiking and uh, learn from both pirates and blind people. The fifth tip, wear clothing that protects your body from heat. Light colored, loose clothing with air spaces allow sweat evaporation and cooling. And uh, we'll talk about light colored clothing, dark clothing, in some cases, what happens. And I learned a few lessons about this as I studied it over the years. Number six, protect yourself from sunburn and bug bites. You know, the chemicals that are in sunscreen and in bug repellent interact with each other. They're not effective when they're used together. You need to know that. And what I do is I use sunscreen on places where skin is exposed and you potentially get sunburns in the back of my neck and things like that. And then I use repellent on my clothing. 
that will keep off of me. And also, we'll talk about some of the old 1800 ways of protecting yourself with uh, ladies' undergarments. And so I'll show you more about that. Finally, number seven, I will demonstrate several different yoga breathing techniques that will help you relax, lower your blood pressure, and cool off your body. So some of these techniques are a little bit unusual. That's, that's what this video is all about. And so let's look at it now, one by one. Living creatures adjust to changes in their environment through both changes in behavior as well as physiological processes. These changes take several days and they're critical for survival to literally all life on Earth. If you can't adapt to change, you die. Heat stroke and death of outdoor workers, athletes, and recreational hikers usually happens in individuals that are not acclimated and their bodies are stretched beyond the breaking point. And so acclimation is extremely important. The acclimated human body is tolerant at to high heat after exposure to gradually increasing time while exercising in hot conditions. And this can happen over a period of one to two weeks. There are specific protocols for this acclimation in sports medicine. For example, exercise in high heat may be a period of two hours followed by cooling off and full rehydration. And then after cooling off, there's then another episode of exercise. And every day, the length and intensity of the activity episodes is increased. And this gradually changes your body physiology. And it's important to rehydrate between exercise episodes. Do not push yourself to the point of heat exhaustion. It will hurt your heat tolerance. Acclimate to the level of work demanded. So if you're simply just sitting in a hot place or doing very light work, your body will acclimate to doing light work or just sitting outdoors. Now, before you go out and exercise, do things to acclimate to extreme heat, please consult a doctor because it's dangerous if you do it wrong. If you are a senior like myself, I do very little exercise during the heat of the day. I, like, and like most of the animals, I hide in the shade a little bit. But simply being outdoors and slowly hiking or walking in temperatures above 100, I can do that much more than I could if I just stayed in indoors in air conditioning. And so you want to get outside and do a little bit of outdoors in the cooler part of the day and then slowly acclimating to higher temperatures. Now I, my body tells me when I need to sit in the shade or put my feet in the creek. But anticipate what your body's needs are. Don't just rely only on your body, particularly with thirst. The benefits of acclimating inc include the following. Heat exposure will cause less strain on your heart and other vital organs. Sweating will improve. Your body will start to sweat earlier than it would if you weren't acclimated. And at a higher volume, another you'll sweat more. And that sweat will have less salt loss. And so everything's good about, about sweating more and cooling. But you need to remember that because you're sweating at a higher volume, you need to drink more water. Now, another benefit of acclimating is that your ability to comfortably perform physical tasks in the heat will be improved. In other words, you'll be comfortable outdoors. Now I'm going to mention again, drink more water when acclimated because you're sweating more and cooling off more. And I repeat that for a reason, because I've learned the hard way about not drinking enough water. So stay hydrated. Do not drink a large volume of water quickly. 
it can upset your um, salt balance and your electrolytes there because you want to have those electrolytes, and potentially that imbalance could cause death if you drink too much water rapidly. And I want to repeat one more time, when going outdoors and acclimating, follow your doctor's recommendations. For seniors, acclimation may simply be being in a hot location and watching the birds. And then for a short while and not performing work. And depending on your situation, you can do more activities, but, but do consult a doctor about it. Microclimates are climates in small areas, which may be very different from the climate of the overall region. Uh, right now it's uh, around uh, nine in the morning and the temperature is 70 degrees, according to the weather forecast and uh, actual measures and the forecast that you see on TV and on, on the internet, the weather information, is taken at uh, about five feet off the ground in open shade. And so that gives you the average temperature and humidity conditions and so forth. But a microclimate is a climate that's in a small area that may be very different from the climate of the overall region. And right here where I'm sitting, there are many different microclimates. For example, in these, these situations right here, the temperature and humidity and wind all are different depending on surface reflection. This white dry riverbed reflects a lot of light, a lot of heat. Also, there are places with surface water down over here, and I'll show you in just a, a moment. They're devices with surface water, and those affect the amount of evaporation. The surface water makes it locally there much more humid. And so the pockets of humidity, and that can cause all sorts of things with more vegetation. Soil composition is an important factor. This area is sandy, and so water moves right through it, and so it's essentially dry. But there are other areas that have a little bit more clay or the water is close to the surface and it's humid. Geological formations make a huge difference. Mountains make a big difference. Hillsides. Have you ever noticed that on hills one side has green and the other side is sort of dry? Well, that's due to the way clouds form and evaporation levels, are essentially they're called rain shadows, Canyons and gullies create cold air sinks. And so all of these things, vegetation, prevailing winds, all of these things create many microclimates in an area. I'm gonna measure microclimates today with an infrared thermometer. This is the one I'm using. It's used in construction and in buildings and checking air conditioning units and so forth. I can tell the temperature that it is right here Looking in the open sunlight, it says it's 76 degrees. In an area like this, there are many different microclimates. And animals move up and down using their behavior and physiology to control their internal body temperature and water requirements. Uh, bodies, animals like to have homeostasis, in other words, constant conditions inside. And mammals, like us, are endotherms as well as birds. In other words, we internally create a certain amount of heat and we have cooling systems. On 98.6 is the core temperature of the average human. We try to do things to maintain it being constant. Well, so do these other animals. They move through this environment. And so if we walk over here, it'll be one temperature. And we're gonna go through and look at some of these microclimates right now, early in the morning and temperature conditions. And uh, there are a lot of animals out here now. I saw quail a few minutes ago uh, in, the, in the brush, all sorts of things, but let's, let's go look around. This is the riverbed next to our house. Most of it, most years is totally dry. 
and areas where there's moisture, there's a lot of green vegetation. This is sandy and gravelly, and that creates a different environment, and there'll be different organisms in it. And wherever there's vegetation, that increases the amount of moisture, and you'll see all sorts of animals around that, that vegetation. This is what's left of the river right now. Remember, we haven't had rain in months and we're extreme high heat, although in the morning it's very comfortable. And there's a dragonfly, and you can see here the water is flowing. Uh, and it's clear. So let's walk through here. And over here, there's more vegetation. And the water is just below the ground. And so the plants have uh, plenty of water to grow. And all of these create habitat for small animals. And they also can create habitat for us. And we can stay comfortable moving around in these microclimates. Maybe we wouldn't want to necessarily be in here, but there are many areas where you would want to explore. Now, I personally have some really favorite areas. So let's, let's go to some. I see a very green area here. It almost looks like a hillside. There's a hillside behind it. And I bet there's a lot of water there. And that's maybe a place where you just want to spend an, an afternoon. Now, there are ways to deal with the insects, and I'll t talk about the little later. It's... This is an area where there's a lot of vegetation, and I see darker spots in the soil, like right down in here. The soil's damp. I'm going to dig a little hole here and then come back in a few hours and see how much water that has in it, how much water is seeped in. This is the sort of area that uh, small animals would go to estivate or to cool off, uh, lowering their, their overheat conditions and uh, tolerating the heat, and then later come out of those areas. I've seen frogs come out from underground places like this in the, during, the, during the evening when it cools off. There's certainly water down here. Man, it's already beginning to fill up. Okay, this is filling up with water, and if I were to let it to, to seep overnight, it would clear out, and if I were in a survival situation, this could be a place where I could get drinking water. Uh, even if, if you see a place where there's damp looking ground, then you know there's water underneath and it's seeping up. 70 degrees. Okay, so it's 114, 15, something like that. So let's just walk out here and get down to the riverbed in a few minutes. But you can see the temperature's changed a lot in just a short while. As I walk down here, you can see in the beginning, the vegetation's dead. And it's really dry and it's hot. 120 degrees, 134 degrees. 
so it's really, really hot. And then as I get down a little further, the vegetation all of a sudden becomes very thick and very green. And this is where there's water underground. And in fact, the soil is so damp here, I suspect the water is just a few inches below the soil. So let's see what the temperature is down here. Ninety-eight. The temperature right here is ninety-eight in the sun. Ninety-seven. And the soil is damp. And I suspect if I dug down a few inches, I would hit groundwater because it all looks sort of mushy. And so this microhabitat is much cooler with cattails and beautiful vegetation. Some of the plants are a little welted. That detura plant's a little welted, but it has plenty of water. Okay, let's continue down here. And there was a place not too far from here where we, where I dug a little trench. Let's see if I can find it. Okay, I found the area where there was a seep. And sure enough, just like I expected, the water level is about the same as it was before, but it's totally clear. And this water, uh, if you were to boil it, would be suitable for drinking, possibly. It would eliminate the biological contaminants, but be not the chemical ones. The temperature of the water is 95. So that's not too bad. That's cooler than the human body, so I would cool off. My core temperature is 98, and so if I stuck my hand in there, I could start to cool off. And temperature out here is 99, so it's a little hotter, but it's still not as hot because of this evaporation in this area. You notice the surface area looks drier than it did before due to the surface evaporation, but there's water down below. Okay, let's look over here. And the water is still 84. So the water underneath all of this is staying at a cool temperature of 84. Very comfortable. Now if I could find water in a place where there was shade, I could just have unbelievable relaxation and stay at a good temperature. Okay, you can see here the temperature is 137. Guys, it really got hot out there on the dry riverbed. The temperature went up to 142 and my phone won't take that heat. So I had to immediately find a, a spot in the shade. And now this is my view. I'm in the shade. I'm under a nice tree and there's a little bit of water behind me. The water's right, right back there. And the water temperature is 79 degrees. And so we're in our comfort zone. I can cool off. Now the big question is, what do animals do, including humans? What can we do when we're in this sort of situation? Well, you try to find a place in the shade where there's vegetation, if you can, or under a big rock where it's sheltered from the sun, sheltered from the heat, and the thermal mass of a huge rock will keep it cool for quite a while during the day, but it gets cool at night. And uh, so you can be comfortable. Now what uh, a lot of animals do is when they find a school, a place like this that's, that's nice and, and, well, I'll show it to you. It's really nice down here. It's a nice gravelly area. Anyway, I can lie on that and press my body against it and I would conduct heat to the ground and the, the ground would, would cause me to be cooler and as a result, 
I would get cool. Ground squirrels do this all the time. I've seen them, particularly in humid environments where there's no other way to get cool. They can't evaporate much because it's so humid. They press their bodies against things that are cooler than themselves and they cool off. Another thing that, that squirrels do, uh, California ground squirrel does this. If it gets too hot, it will simply find a place as cool as it could be and it essentially goes into torpor or what's called estivation. It drops its body temperature, it breathes very slowly, metabolism drops, and it just holds out until it uh, cools off, until it, until it cools off and then it can become active. So, so animals do that, people can do that to some extent, and I'll tell you more about that later. When you need to get warm, you sit in the sun to warm up. So you move back and forth. Right now, we need to cool off. I found this little area, and there's several of them here. Uh, and you'll find them in every habitat you are, some place where it's a little cooler. And this little thermometer, this uh, infrared thermometer is unbelievable because it gives instantaneous temperature so you know exactly what's, what's happening. Now, you know, I, I studied antelope ground squirrels uh, in the Maha, uh, Mojave Desert for my graduate um, work. And they do a couple of things. They, they lie flat. They, when it's too hot, they go into estivation or torpor. I was the first one to discover that, by the way. And then uh, they use their tails. They have little tails. They put their tails over their head as a sunscreen to the rest of their body, so their core body temperature drops. And uh, it's unbelievable the sorts of adaptations that these, these critters have. Another thing to do is animals that are hot try to increase their surface area. So they spread out, open-armed, uh, if you're a bird, uh, whatever they do to spread out to increase their relative surface area. Animals that live in hot environments, including human beings, tend to be thinner and taller, if we're talking about native peoples, than if they live in hot environments. In, war in cold environments, they're rounder. And the reason is when you're rounder, when you have more girth, you have less surface area per body mass. And so that keeps you warm in a cold environment. In a warm environment, you want to be thin and lean, and that allows you more surface area. There's a lot written about that. And, you know, even rabbits do this. Their ears radiate out. So what we could do is I take my hat off. I take a scarf on and put water on it, maybe from this creek, screen it out a little bit because I don't know what's in it, and allow that to evaporate on my body. And that will cool me. So I'd get, maybe I'd get my shirt wet. Uh, and that sort of thing allows you to stay cool through evaporation. Now, my twin brother studied these ground beetles, and I'll show you a picture of them. They're black. And you wonder, how do these black beetles survive? It's a hot desert. Well, underneath their black outside of the beetle, their body is inside with a big airspace between their body and this shell. And that airspace is insulation. And so it it helps keep their body temperature constant more because in the deserts, like it here, it gets cold at night. It may be hot during the day, but really cold at night. And so they can be out at night. And when it's cold in the winter, the black helps them warm up and the insulation helps keep it constant. And then they move up and down. They eat little dead things, dead vegetation and things like that. It's called detritus they eat. They move up and down during the day. They have homeostasis, a common internal temperature. And so there are very neat things that animals do. We can do some of the same things. We can do some of the same things with our clothing, the way the black beetles do. But uh, that's a, a different point. So uh, mammals can slow their metabolism, as I mentioned. Conduction, big rocks, climbing in holes having fun, moving to another microhabitat. So that is it for 
using microhabitats. Okay, the river's nearby. This is a spot that where folks used to have fires and they are not allowed. $10,000 fines and maybe jail time. So you don't want to do it. It's so relaxing just to lie in this hammock. Wow. There are not too many biting insects, but I did put on sunscreen and a bug repellent. Man, it's just so beautiful. My feet are almost cold because of the cold water and the contrast with the beautiful warm sun and the beauty. Just the sound of nature only the sound of nature. What's for lunch, you ask? Apple juice, unsweetened. Sandwich, and I think that's tuna fish. And cookies. These were made in a solar oven and I haven't eaten them yet. Two left cookies. So, bon appetit. Mmm. It's so good. You can't beat being in a hammock in the middle of a creek surrounded by all this beauty. Just unbelievable. I wish I could live here. The uh, dragonflies and and other little creatures are eating the mosquitoes, you know, the whole thing's just a natural world. Natural. Insects aren't bothering me. It's cool, even though we, it's going to be 100 degrees today, but not here in the river. This is how you beat the heat. Well, I've just finished lunch, and uh, let's explore downstream a little bit. Before we have to head back home, I want to see what's down here. Man. 
looks so interesting. You know, this river just goes for miles, and it's a wild and scenic river. This area has been designated as a wild and scenic a river. It has endangered species. It is unbelievable. And this year, it's even better than it was last year. It, the uh, when the river was higher, it cleared out some of the brush, so I think I can walk it easier than before. And there are trails up there that I could take, but let's just for now see how the river leads us. Now I'm walking very carefully and slowly with my pole because I don't want to get too much higher than almost my waist. But let's see. Man, this looks interesting. Can you imagine going like this for miles? Unbelievable beauty. I'm going to be quiet and just, just listen and watch. Snack time, cookies, mmm, solar oven cookies. And water. I bet I don't see anybody on this trail. And it's the nicest trail around and everybody else is sweltering with 100 degree temperatures. And here it is. I don't think it's over, over 65 or 70 right where I am. Awesome beauty, great relaxation. <laughs>